Good morning. I am Gina Rezbampur as the proud region president of Women's League for Conservative Judaism. I would like to welcome you to our 74th region conference. Our conference committee has worked hard to provide you with an exciting and informative program. Attending conference is the first step into the world of your region. Women's League and the support that we offer to you and your sisterhood. We know you will find the talk stimulating and the information useful. I wish you all a successful conference. Make the most of this experience and I hope you enjoy it. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our hardworking, tireless conference VP, Carol Matthew. Thank you so much, Gina. I am the Pacific Southwest Region Conference Vice President. I appreciate the support and help that everyone has given me during the past three years, even though the circumstances were anything but normal this past year. I am thrilled to see so many of you at conference this year. I would like to ask everyone to make sure your first and last name appears on your screen. If it doesn't, Click in the upper right side of your photo to change your name. It will say rename. We cannot recognize the name, iPad, or cell phones. Our sessions are being recorded. If you do not want to be seen, click on the three dots in the upper right of your photo, then click on hide self view. Then just your name will appear. During all breaks and lunch, the tribute ads will be displayed on screen. Thank you so much for attending today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce cantor Jacqueline Raffi, who is the cantorial soloist and director of music at Shomri Torah Synagogue, singing the national anthem followed by Hatikva. Cantor Raffi. say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through
Kenner Raffi, that was just beautiful. We are, we are privileged to have Debbie Kenner Goldage with us today. She is the 23rd International President of Women's League for Conservative Judaism and a member of our. Pacific Southwest region also. Please welcome Debbie Kenner College. Thank you, Gina. I am a proud member of the PSW region. Shalom friends, good morning. As president of Women's League for Conservative Judaism, I welcome you to your region conference. It is a pleasure for me to greet you today although I wish we were together, biyachad, in person. This has been a unique and challenging year. We started our year with, virtual, with our virtual international convention in July. Since then, we have offered continuous programming with opportunities for learning and engagement. Our weekly newsletter encourages our members to join programs in sisterhoods and regions all over North America. In spite of the pandemic, the newsletter tells everyone that Women's League is alive and well. If you are not subscribed to it, please let Gina or Carol or me know and we will connect you. During these past 12 months, I have had the opportunity to greet many of you through the magic of Zoom. Together, we have celebrated sisterhood paid up membership events, Torah fund events, Women's League Shabbat services, and now region conferences. Those visits are an important part of my role as Women's League president. Your comments and suggestions to me allow our organization to move forward with fresh ideas. Please continue to invite me to your events so you can reach out personally. Soon, I hope to be on the road traveling and would love to be together with you in person. It's just a short jump from Scottsdale, Arizona to California. And so today, as you are together with your region sisters at your conference, please take advantage of all that your sisterhood region and the international organization has to offer you as a conservative Jewish woman. Please join me in thanking your outgoing region officers and board and Gina as president for their hard work and support of Women's League over the last three years. And please welcome Carol and your incoming executive committee and board as they embark on an exciting road ahead. Thank you and Lahitra Oat. I hope to see you all in person very soon. Shalom. Thank you, Debbie, for being with us today. We are honored that you are part of our region. I would like to welcome Susan ben Rubin, our conference consultant for this year. She has been the co-president of her sisterhood of Herzl near Tomet in Mercer Island, Washington for three years, and has served on the sisterhood board for five years. She has been an active on the North by Northwest region board as well most recently serving as the Region Torah Fund Vice President and the Region Representative for the International Board. Susan. Thank you, Carol. I am so glad to be here with the Pacific Southwest region. And I just wanted to echo Debbie's comments about Women's League that we are alive and well, even during the pandemic. There has been so many mm -hmm. wonderful programs that have been put on and so many people around the world that have joined us for those programs. Uh, the one thing I would like to put in a plug for is our consulting services. 
If your synagogue would like some help from consulting services, please give us a ring, uh, send us an email, and uh, we, uh, we present seminars on how to use Zoom, leadership development, sisterhood synagogue relations for all members. We can do personalized workshops for sisterhoods, and we work collaboratively with the membership and per capita teams to provide better service for our affiliates. Uh, happy to be a consultant and happy to be here. Thank you. I'm not sure you just heard me because I think I was muted, but thank you for your participation, insight, and help with our conference. Roberta? Nope, me. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Deb. That's okay, Carol. Um, you can go ahead. Um, Deb is our conference vice consultant. She is a past international vice president, Women's League Israel chair, and a member of the Torah Fund cabinet currently. In addition to being a consultant, she is Women's League for Conservative Judaism's reporting secretary. Take it away, Deb. Good, good. I was going to say good afternoon, but good morning. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to be part of your conference. Um, it's been a privilege to work with such dedicated women and to put together such an amazing uh, day for you. I look forward to partaking in all the um, activities that you have planned today. And I just want to say thank you very much to Carol, to Gina, and to Susan Ben-Rubin. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Roberta Spacha. I'm the Pacific Southwest Region Torah Fund Vice President. I want to thank you all for your support of Torah Fund now and throughout the years. It is not too late to make your Torah Fund donation for this year's campaign. It is with your contributions that we ensure the future of the conservative Masorti movement through the education provided in our five seminaries. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the video recording of our International Tour Fund Chair, Barbara Ezring. I'm so happy to be with you at your region conference. I'm Barbara Ezring, International Chair of Women's League for Conservative Judaism's Philanthropy, Torah Fund. What an amazing and challenging year of fundraising we're having. Our usual approaches to raising money have been tweaked. Very special volunteers followed unique protocols to go to JTS to sort, pack, and label Torah Fund pins. Many pins traveled to a variety of cities before they reached their destinations. And some pins are still on their way to their recipients. You developed virtual Torah Fund events that wowed. You introduced your members to students and graduates of all five institutions of higher Jewish learning that we support. You studied Torah learned about foods and customs in the cities of our seminaries, heard beautiful music, visited museum exhibits, mixed drinks, and honored special people in your communities. Everyone had fun, but most important, Sisterhood Torah Fund Chairs and Vice Presidents maintained relationships with our Torah Fund donors. Thank you so much. And thank you to your Region Torah Fund Vice President. You trained, organized, emailed, phoned, attended meetings, supported your sisterhoods, and created region-wide virtual events. It is always the right time to donate to Torah Fund. Your gifts to the Torah Fund General Campaign provide programming, and scholarships for students who attend the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies in Los Angeles, 
Schechter Institutes in Jerusalem, Seminario Rabinico Latino Americano in Buenos Aires, and Zacharias Frankel College in Potsdam. Contributions to the special project, Creating New Spaces, will be used at Ziegler for the Women's League Institute on Gender Bias and Harassment, and at JTS for the Women's League Study Space in the new Undergraduate Residence Hall. Plan for the future. Join the Torah Fund Legacy Society and ensure the future for the students of our institutions of higher Jewish learning with your bequest. We are so grateful for your creativity, your enthusiasm, and your patience during this challenging year. Todah Rabah to each of you for your continued support and donations to Torah Fund. Biachad, together we guarantee Jewish continuity. Twenty twenty one milestone awards. This year, our milestone award goes to seven sisterhoods in our region. This is the years of their affiliation with Women's League. Congregation Nertamid of South Bay. Rancho Palas Verdes, California, 60 years. Sisterhood President, Linda Alexander. Women's League of Congregation Orzion, Scottsdale, Arizona, 60 years. Sisterhood President, Skidder Marcus. Congregation B'nai Israel, Albuquerque, New York, Mexico, 65 years. Sisterhood co-presidents, Christina Buckhalter, and Sisterhood co-president, Nori Yonek. Temple Beth Emmet, Santa Ana, California, 65 years. Sisterhood president, Barbara Erler. Pasadena Jewish Temple and Center, Pasadena, California, 75 years. Sisterhood presidents, Nancy Colton. Temple Beth M, Beverly Hills, California, 75 years, Sisterhood President, Annie Spar. Congregation, B'nai Zion, El Paso, Texas, 100 years, Sisterhood President, Sarah Williams. Congratulations to all. Now, we, I would like to hold our election for Pacific Southwest Region Board for 2021-2024. <coughs> I would like to call on our nominating committee chair, Michelle Gabay, for her report. Thank you, Gina. It is my pleasure to present the 2021-2024 slate as put forward by the nominating committee. First slide, please. For president, Carol Madvig, Shomre Torah Synagogue. Vice president, administration, Gina Seaman, Temple Ramat Sion. Communication services, Karen Deutsch, uh, Bally Beth Shalom. Conference VPs, Michelle Gabay, Sinai Temple, and Lisa Pompin, Sinai Temple. Sisterhood support, Maxine Silverberg, Shomre Torah Synagogue. Torah Fund, Marcy Melton, Sinai Temple. Secretaries, Financial, Marjorie Frimkus, Temple Aliyah. Recording Secretary, Deborah Cadis, Congregation Beth Shalom. Treasurer, Judith Fisher, Sinai Temple. Next slide, please. Uh, board members and activity chairpersons, Graphic Arts, Erit Chapnick, 
Temple Beth Emmett. Social media and webmaster, Karen Deutsch, Valley Best Showroom. Social media e-bulletin, still open. Conference and retreat team leaders, programming and activities, Miriam Hearn, Adat Shalom. Bertina Joseph, Congregation Beth Shalom. Sukha, Roberta Spasia, Adat Ariel. Volunteer, Kim Memmer, Temple Beth Shalom, Las Vegas. Ways and Means Open. Raffle Chair, Cindy Shear, Temple Etz Chaim. Boutique, Deborah Cadis, Congregation Beth Shalom. And World Israel, Joanne Leeds. Uh, Temple Aliyah. Next slide, please. Sisterhood Area Directors, Area Support Directors, Brenda Katz, Temple Beth Shalom, Las Vegas. Rebecca Friedman, Temple Beth Am, Lori Hoffman, Congregation Beth Shalom, Sandra Braun, Temple Beth Am, Margot Jaffe Orr, Congregation Beth Shalom, and we still have two open slots. Torah Fund Area Directors, Bertina Joseph, Congregation Beth Shalom, Janet Sama, Temple Beth Shalom, Las Vegas, Susan Baum, Temple Beth Emmett, and four open slots. And last slide, please. Our team members are Cindy Alderton from Congregation Beth Shalom, Susan Cohen from Temple Ramat Sion, Agnes Emmert from Temple Beth Am, Dina Gordon from Temple Aliyah and Ramat Sion, Rhoda Lipsig from Shomre Torah Synagogue, Lori Mallon from Congregation Beth Shalom, and we have two additional representatives to the International Board, Karen Deutsch from Valley Beth Shalom and Marcy Melton from Sinai Temple. Thank you so much, Michelle. It was great, great job. And Thank we will hopefully fill the other positions. Since there are no additional nominations, I would like to call on our recording secretary, Gail Nyman. Okay, are there any objections to the board to the slate as presented? Hearing none, I accept, I, I present the ballot as accepted unanimously. My congratulations to these outstanding, dedicated and committed women who are now elected for the 2021-2024 term of Pacific Southwest region. Congratulations to all of you and Yashakoa. Thank you so much, Gina, Michelle, and Gail. We will do the best job for you. <laughs> I would now like to um, introduce Rabbi David Klasper. He is the moderator for our panel discussion today. He is the transitional senior rabbi at Congregation Ortzion in Scottsdale, Arizona. Rabbi <clears throat> is committed to supporting the needs of Jewish families at every stage of life. Rabbi Klasper. Okay. Now, thank you, Carol. It's a pleasure to be with you all. In our history books, we are used to dividing up events as BCE or CE, before the Common Era and the Common Era. Well, now we can mark time as BC, before COVID, and DC, during COVID. We are likely to be DC for a while longer, but God willing, we will eventually arrive at AC after COVID. And then what? What will our lives look like after all of the massive changes that the pandemic has wrought? And not only our home lives and work lives, what will our Jewish lives look like AC? 
To discuss this, we have a really wonderful panel this morning. To introduce them, I thought I would say just a few words about each of them. I want to keep this brief. We don't want this to be the kind of Jewish meeting where we spend more time introducing the speakers than actually hearing from them. And as I introduce them one by one, I will ask each of them to share some of their personal and professional experiences DC during COVID. And I hope that will help to contextualize our discussion. So in no particular order, let me begin by introducing Chad Rose. Chad is the principal of the Stevenson Ranch Elementary School. He's been an elementary principal for 15 years. He has a master's degree in educational administration and Chad and his wife have lived in the Santa Clarita Valley for over 16 years and are the proud parents of two children in the local school system. So Chad, please share with us briefly uh, some of your own personal and professional experiences during COVID. Thank you and good morning. Uh, well, personally, um, my wife is also a teacher in addition to me being a principal, she's a teacher. So, and our kids are in elementary school and high school. So we're getting it from all sides, both professionally and personally with how this pandemic plays out. It's been a real learning experience for our family in our household, trying to navigate friends and family and the wide range of beliefs in how to comply with health guidelines and recommendations. Um, one perfect example is my, my younger daughter is on a dance team. And throughout the pandemic, her dance team has kids who are in the studio practicing regularly and we won't let her go. It's against recommendations, it's not safe yet. Uh, we are taking, helping take care of grandparents and close friends and we can't risk having her in the studio during the pandemic. And it was really hard for her to understand why she's the only one on a Zoom call to learn her dance routine when other parents let their kids go in. Um, my high schooler um, has had to learn how to maintain friendships. She went from junior high to high school in the middle of the pandemic. Her junior high year ended in March and she started high school online just now is finally on her high school campus. Had to figure out where's everything? How do I keep in touch with friends? How do I learn? Um, she shared with us her uh, math teacher. She has a wonderful math teacher. We, we were told we're so lucky. This is the best math teacher you're ever going to have. And um, online hasn't been a great learning experience for her as when she got to go back to school and learn with that teacher in person. She's like, wow, I see it now. I didn't see it online, but I see it now. So personally, it's been really interesting trying to navigate all the different um, rules uh, of our community and then the different levels of people following through with that. Professionally, um, the pandemic has really tested my community. Um, you know, we have students, you know, in, in the high school level, kids can read, they know how to use computers. They, they've been using the Google Classroom platforms in junior highs and high schools for years. But in elementary school, we're teaching kids to read and write. They're not learning how to use Google Classroom. You take a kindergartner who needs to learn how to read, how to sound out letters and blend sounds and read words. You can't give them directions on a computer and say, here, read this and do this activity. They need step-by-step -step directions live with an adult. Not to mention a lot of kindergartners, while they're great with their video games and great with their iPads, may not know how to troubleshoot a Google Classroom lesson, how to fix the connection. So they need a lot of support from their parents to participate in school in the first place just by being nature being at home. Then added to that, the normal things of being a young student, how to follow routines, how to stay organized with materials, how to continue to follow directions. All these things fell in our parent community. And now you have parents who are working from home or trying to work out of the home and have care for their children while they're home from school, or they've been uh, laid off and trying to figure out how are they gonna make ends meet and help my kid go to school with everything else going on. Then you have my staff. I have a great staff. I'm very fortunate at my school, but we ha we're not trained to teach online in elementary school teachers. We don't teach online as a normal practice. Our, our, we're an in-person <laughs> job. And so I've had to work with teachers to the struggle of figuring out how to work online, how to make the best of the situation for their students. We want our kids reading and writing and, and computing math facts. And you, it's hard to do that when you're a distance, distance on a computer. 
not to mention the emotional side of that. You know, we are a very social group. You know, we talk to people all day long. We're talking to kids, we're talking to parents, we're talking to each other. Well, now when we're on campus, if we're on campus, uh, teaching, a lot of my teachers taught from their classrooms online, you can't visit with anybody. You can't go sit in the staff lounge and talk. You can't walk through the hallways and visit. You can't even meet together. Our staff meetings are online. Then I have the parent community. I have a wonderfully supportive community. About 95% of my community understood we did the best we could and were supportive of that and appreciative of all the things we did. Um, then there's the 5% that listen to the news and hear the, and believe that what they hear is it represents all teachers. You know, a teacher's union in Los Angeles doesn't apply to my school district. Our, my teachers want to be at work. They want to be in person with kids. We had three different false starts in our district. Well, we're going to start, we're going to open up, oh, we got to wait. Oh, we're going to start, we got to wait. And that was crushing to our parents who were ready to send their kids out of the house for a little bit and crushing to our teachers who were ready to teach. So trying to help everyone stay positive and keep a community going was really a challenge. We had PTA meetings online. We have staff meetings online. We held awards banquets. We did family reading nights. And trying to make all these things happen online is really um, a, not the norm for us, but definitely a new skill set we've developed in the course of this year. Um, so it's been it's been a lot of learning experiences this year, in you know professionally and and personally. And I'm looking forward to the next steps. You know we're now a school that's open full day, full schedule. Uh, first week down, it's been wonderful to see the kids back on on campus. And I'm thankful that our district has given parents choices. We do have parents who aren't ready for this, who aren't ready to leave the house. And so our school district has given choices to parents. Of, you can stay online 100% or go to school regular. It's really up to you. And so it's, it's and now what the future brings is, is kind of a new challenge. What's next? What's next you're going to look like? What's our ongoing uh, digital platform going to look like? And I look forward to all those new experiences with my students, teachers, and community. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Dr. Mark Hoffman is a family medicine specialist affiliated with Kaiser Permanente in Panorama City, California. He is a frequent speaker on behalf of Kaiser Permanente. And uh, he is an assistant clinical professor of family medicine at Western University of Health Sciences. So Dr. Hoffman, please, please share some of your personal and professional experiences, DC, Great. during COVID. Well, good morning, everyone. And, and first and foremost, I want to thank the Pacific Southwest Region Women's League and my co-panelists for this opportunity to be on the dais with everyone. Just an honor and a privilege to be with this esteemed panel. So first and foremost, thank you. As you heard, I'm Dr. Mark Hoffman. I'm a family physician, been practicing some 32 years in a suburb of Los Angeles County uh, in the Santa Clarita Valley, actually, uh, where Chad is from. And uh, been uh, involved in that, been involved in teaching medical students, interns, and residents as well. And I also am part of a large organization, the Southern California Permanente Medical Group. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with us, we service about 12 million members nationally, have 21,000 physicians, over 200 employees, 40 hospitals, over 700 medical offices. Uh, so we're a large uh, organization caring for uh, individuals. Uh, there have been a number of things going on recently that have affected all of us. First, there's the COVID-19 health pandemic. And put that into perspective, uh, I think what we need to understand that as of today, COVID-19 actual cases are over 32 million. We've distributed about 230 million vaccines to date. We've had over 570,000 deaths. And, and if you remember, that's in the framework of a United States population of about 330 million. So many of us have either been affected, no individuals that have been affected, and it really is very concerning. But in addition to that, there are other pandemics going on, so to speak, besides this large health pandemic, including focus on equity, inclusion, diversity, 
and for many people, a financial pandemic in, in what has occurred over the last almost two years now. I think for us personally, as physicians, one of the things that's occurred is a movement into a much more robust virtual platform of care delivery. Initially, we weren't seeing uh, non very ill patients at all. Uh, caring for patients within the hospital systems, you're actually wearing close to a spacesuit as you're dealing with them uh, during the height of this pandemic, unprecedented volumes. And I think as we're moving slowly out of the pandemic, at least the healthcare pandemic, we really need to be aware that there's been a lot of focus on coping with uncertainty, uh, really thoughts around mind-body mind connection. How do we better care for ourselves, especially in a world where the social interactions have been somewhat limited? How do we focus on resiliency? What action plans do we have as individuals? And hopefully as we get through our conversation this morning, we'll have an opportunity to help those of you that haven't developed a game plan for re-entry uh, into uh, a, more, a more robust society. So thank you and with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Rabbi Adam Greenwald is the Vice President for Jewish Engagement at American Jewish University, where he oversees the Moss Center for Jewish Journeys and the Miller Introduction to Judaism program. He also lectures at the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies. And in 2016, Rabbi Greenwald received the prestigious Covenant Foundation's Pomegranate Prize in Jewish education. Adam, please share some of your own personal and professional experiences. Sure, thank you. And thank you for having me here. Um, it's wonderful to be on this panel with, uh, with so many insightful people and to get the chance to speak to Women's League. I, I always start any opportunity um, in getting to speak with this group with my gratitude. I am a graduate of the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies. I would not have um, my, my life path um, really is due to the hard work of so many of you on this call and beyond. And I'm pleased to see friends and supporters um, in the gallery as I'm looking. It's really wonderful to be with you and thank you for giving me the very best job I could possibly have imagined. Um, I am a pandemic parent to a 22 month old today. Um, my Gracie is just about the cutest toddler in the world. I'm willing to fight anybody for that designation. Um, and the joys and oys of pandemic parenthood have been very real for our family. Um, I'll start with the joy. There is no other world in which I would have been present for my daughter's first steps, for her first words, that we would have gotten to spend hours together in the middle of the day, every single day in any other timeline, I would have gotten perhaps to see her right when she woke up in the morning and late at night just before putting her down and missed everything in between as frankly my father did with me and his father did with him. And the reality of this year and working from home has meant that I have gotten to be much more directly connected with these incredible and irreplaceable moments in my daughter's life. And for that, I feel really, really thankful. And I'll tell you, it's also really hard. Um, we had our first paid childcare in our home this week. Um, other than that, for the last 14 months, my wife who also works and I have been trading back and forth childcare duties. And the responsibility to be a full-time professional and also to be a full-time parent to a very active little girl um, is well over 100% time. And so that feeling of perpetual failure that comes with not being able to fully devote oneself to one's work or fully devote oneself to one's child has been really palpable both for Anne and I this year as we have tried our best um, to weather this situation that, uh, that we've all found ourselves in. Professionally, um, I run the Miller Introduction to Judaism program at American Jewish University, which is the largest program in North America, helping people to become Jewish. Um, we've had 15,000 students 
over the course of our 35 years, more than 5,000 of whom have officially joined the Jewish people through conversion. Um, we offered in-person classes up until March of 2020, and then, like everyone else, made an abrupt switch to Zoom. Again, there have been positives and negatives of this. The, the positives are really extraordinary. When we switched to online classes, our class size doubled or tripled. This year, we are looking at perhaps 600 students taking the Miller Introduction to Judaism program across North America and across 11 countries worldwide. I'm actually missing my usual Sunday morning class to be here with you. It is very capably being taught by uh, my associate rabbi, Rabbi Morris Panitz, another wonderful graduate of the Ziegler School. But in that class, there are 20 time zones represented. As students join us from Japan and the Philippines, and students join us from Belfast in Northern Ireland, from Munich, Germany, from Lithuania and Austria, all sharing the same Zoom screen, all learning together about Jewish history, values, and ideas. There is no other reality um, that uh, could have held this possibility. I'll tell you about one student in particular, a woman who joins our class from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where it's not entirely clear it's legal to join an introduction to Judaism class. She is an English teacher who has lived the last 10 years uh, traveling lifestyle teaching in various countries. She is spending two years as a teacher in Saudi Arabia and has had a fascination with Judaism for the better part of a decade, but because of her life has never been able to take a class before. So she comes and learns with me once a week. She attends Shabbat services um, with Park Avenue Synagogue on the East Coast. She takes Menachem Creditor's daily Torah class. She is one of the most involved Jews I know, and she's doing it all from the American compound in Riyadh. That's pretty incredible. And I'll tell you, as I'm sure um, Chad would, would reflect with his own students, as he said, that it's, it's challenging to be an educator through a screen. It's challenging to speak to a little green light rather than a living, breathing human being. Um, as my classes have grown larger and more spread out, I am for the first time having the experience of not deeply feeling like I know my students or them getting the opportunity to know me beyond my little square in this virtual limbo that we all live in. So we've had a massive expansion of reach, but also a, a change in what it really feels like to be in these sacred relationships and, and, uh, and limitations that are unavoidable, that are a result of the medium. So I am extraordinarily conscious of the ways that I have been blessed over the past 14 months, all of this extra time with my daughter, all of these opportunities to learn with people I never would have otherwise met. And I'm pretty tired. I suspect a lot of you are too. It has been a lot of work to be a parent through this. It's been a lot of work to be a professional through this. And as we begin to see the first rays of light uh, breaking over the horizon, I am very ready to get back to some normalcy in my life and also to think about the ways in which these months have been a teacher and to think about how um, the new world might look even better than the world that was. Adam, thank you. Dr. Ruth Fisher is a, uh, an experienced psychotherapist. She received her PhD from University of Wisconsin at Madison and was a woman pioneer at the Langley Porter Neuropsychiatric Institute in San Francisco. She has served as a psychologist at the VA hospital in San Fernando Valley. She was in charge of outpatient psychology at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. She was a consultant to the Dignity Center, which is a community-based program for Black youth. And uh, she has been in private practice for many years and is still working. 
Ruth, please share with us some of your own uh, personal and, and professional experiences, DC, during COVID. When he said I'm still working, it's because I will be 80 in June. So I do have a small private practice. And I wanna let you all know how happy I am to be here with you and share from my perspective as an individual and as a psychologist. And I'm also happy to represent women on this panel at the Women's League Conference. We've been living through a liminal period, one that is different than any of us have ever experienced. It is one of profound change Life and death have been at the fore. We do not know what the world will be like when the pandemic is over. What we do know is it will be different. We have all been changed by this period where so many have died or been extremely ill. Numerous have lost their income and countless have been in constant peril because of their work. When we face adversity, we do well to emulate trees, allowing ourselves to be flexible, growing our roots so they become wider and deeper. Much goes into making up our individual system of roots, the foundation upon which we stand. My own personal spiritual beliefs have been become more profound during this period. My creativity has expanded into writing a memoir. And my practice of gratitude and generosity have enhanced. The most challenging aspect of this pandemic for me were periods where I could not see my son because of his exposure to COVID during his work as a video photographer. And my son is adorable too, even at 31. Uh, during the same period, we may experience fear, grief, worry, anxiety, irritability, and depression. Wisdom does not exempt us from any of this. It has been a roller coaster ride to a greater or lesser degree for most. Each of us is on a unique journey where we have had many choices to make. Our internal and external resources and circumstances, our beliefs, our strengths, our use of stress registers all play a part in how we are doing. There's no one right way or wrong way to go through this or to emerge from it. I personally have had periods of being glued to the TV during this time and others where I have had almost no exposure. Some of us will emerge rapidly from the pandemic, while others like myself will do so with considerable deliberation. We must listen to ourselves and what is right for us. The pandemic has taken place at a time where our nation has been torn apart. We have been experiencing something akin to a civil war with neighbor against neighbor. The willingness to wear masks being one expression of the differences. Extreme financial inequities, religious prejudices, racial injustices, gender biases, ethnic hatred, natural disasters have reached an all time high for the period in which most of us have been alive and aware. When I have pondered this, one of the many tools I personally have used to center myself is to focus on what I have observed over 50 years as a psychologist. The, the healing of a nation is metaphorically like the healing of an individual through psychotherapy. People to a greater or lesser degree do not like to change and will contend with almost anything rather than leave where they're comfortable. I imagine most of you have heard of people entering psychotherapy because they were unhappy with one thing in their lives. 
And after a few months, they are aware of so much more that was churning under the surface. And the psychotherapist says, often to themselves, and now we can really begin the work of healing. That's where I feel we are as a nation. People and nations will not heal until what is eroding inside is exposed. While this has been a period of extreme national division, it has also been a time of worldwide cooperation regarding the development of and the distribution of vaccines. Ultimately, we are safe only if all people are safe. And I also want to echo that with Zoom, I've been square dancing with people from Brazil, from Japan, from Spain, from England, all over the place. And it's been great fun to get to know them. And we are now emerging from isolation. When I'm around someone with a vastly different perspective, I remind myself to practice deep listening as I do in psychotherapy and then communicate from that space. I appreciate your listening and thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruth. I'm now going to um, ask a few questions of the panel. And then I will open it up to you. Uh, you, the audience, are welcome to submit questions via private chat to me. Uh, please, to me directly and, and not to the panelists. And I will relay your questions to the panel. So first, for all of us, the pandemic has been an experience of loss. And we have suffered many different kinds of losses. Some of us are grieving loved ones. Some are grieving financial losses. Some are grieving their loneliness and isolation. Some are feeling the loss of physical contact with their family. So my question is, how do we name the losses? And once we've named the losses, how do we grieve the losses? I was talking to a congregant the other day who said to me, uh, other people have worse problems than me. And I responded, Maybe so, but you have the right to grieve your own losses. So let me turn that over to the panel. Anyone who would like to respond, please unmute yourself. I will. I was trying to let somebody else since I just talked, <laughs> but it is so essential that we label our losses label the feelings that we're having and allow them to go through us rather than getting stuck with them. If we don't label them, if we just say somebody else's was worse and we don't acknowledge our own, then we're not able to really grieve. And if we don't grieve, we get stuck. And then we become a victim. The feelings are stuck inside of us. There's a lot that we're collectively grieving now. The loss of our sense of general safety, normalcy, the fear of economic toll, the loss of connection, the loss of physical touch. And I really want to stress the loss of physical touch for a second because hugging is so important and that's something that most of us have missed. We may have it with whoever we're living with, but we don't have as many hugs as we all have every day. And hugs release oxytocin. They're called the bonding hormone, the love hormone. And if you don't have, if you don't have somebody in your pod that you can hug, if you have an animal, hug that. 
dogs and cats actually do release oxytocin for us. So cuddle with them too. Cuddle with whoever you can cuddle with. Hug whomever you can. Um, for those of you who have not read books on grief, it might be helpful at this time. David Kessler and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross together have written books on grief that are so helpful. And they go through the stages, which I won't do here unless I'm asked to. Um, and I want to remind you, a lot of times we're having fear and anticipatory grief now. If this is going on for you and you can label it, then you can see that you need to bring yourself back to the present. That you're not, it's not what's happening now, it's in the future. So keep bringing yourself back to the present and focus on that. And one last thing and then I'll get off. Um, if you haven't read Viktor Frankl's book in a long time or ever, and you're really and you're struggling with this, or even if you're not, man's search for meaning is so important. And I do have a quote from him. Uh, Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, or a woman, but one thing to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Thank you. And, and if I could add it, and Ruth, that was spot on. Uh, you know, during this unprecedented COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, people that did have uh, adverse outcomes that died really were dying alone in the hospital. Loved ones were not there at the time. And, and grieving was done very much in a remote, in a video fashion. That opportunity to say goodbye was stolen, so to speak, from many individuals. And I think the other part of the healing and recognition process is there are things that are within our control as human beings. There are things that are not within our control. And forgiveness is extremely important and recognition is extremely important, especially if your loved one or someone that was close to you passed on and you weren't able to be there at the last moment. Uh, they were alone and isolated. And, and you can actually extend that, unfortunately, to what's been happening, you know, at our internment services where that sense of community and belonging around you isn't necessarily there as you're laying your loved one to rest. So, so I think recognition, if you need help, ask for help, and all the other uh, points that uh, Ruth touched on are extremely important. Thank you. There's a story that I keep coming back to this year that comes from Robert Fulgham, who you might remember is the author of Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. He's a Unitarian minister and, and a Rebbe. Um, and I, I learned this story actually by way of Rabbi Ed Feinstein, who I know is a rabbi to, to many, if not most of us. Um, he describes a, a moment of sitting in his study and looking out the window on an autumn afternoon and seeing kids play hide and go seek and watching one kid hide under this big pile of fallen leaves. And, uh, and the other kids look and look, but the kid is hid so well that nobody can find him. And ultimately the kid emerges out of the leaves in, in tears and, and goes to his friends and says, why did you stop looking for me? And they said, you hid too well. And I, I think a lot of us um, are used to hiding very well. We have never been more public, many of us with our lives, splashing photographs up on the internet for everybody to see, sharing our day-by-day -day status report with anybody who happens to be our, our Facebook friend. Um, and we've also never been more adept at, uh, at concealing what's actually going on in isolation from one another, we don't, we don't see people's pain and they don't see ours. And I think now more than ever, it behooves us to not hide too well, um, to make sure that we are naming our pain, as, as Rabbi Klatsker, you said, 
um, that we are seeking out Dr. Fisher people to cuddle with um, and announcing the need. I need a hug. Um, and if I can't get it safely from somebody outside of my pod, I'm going to need to find a pet and squeeze them. Um, the, the, the instinct to hide is a very human instinct, and it's not a helpful instinct right now. I think the more that we are open about what is churning inside of us, the more that we can do for each other what, what we all want to do, which is to be there to be a support. I will, um, I will share with you that um, my own wife passed away one year ago in March. Uh, Randy had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, she did not have the virus, uh, but she passed away in the middle of the pandemic in California. And um, what I discovered was that my sharing my vulnerability on Zoom and on Facebook and in emails and on the telephone, my sharing my vulnerability with others invited them to share their vulnerability with me. And I think that's a terribly important point. We have to be willing to share our pain. And when we do that, we will discover that other people will share their pain with us. Anyone else want to uh, chip in? So let me go on to the next question. Um, can you offer some tips for balancing family life, work, and Jewish life at home, as long as some of us will still be um, self-isolating, and that may be uh, for some of us uh, for a while yet. So how do we balance family life, work, and Jewish life, and uh, what are some stress reducers? So I can go ahead and start. Oh, I'm sorry, Chad, did you want to start? All right. So first thing is, there's a lot of stressors obviously involved with the COVID-19 pandemic with kind of this forced isolation. And, and I think for life in general, you need to make sure that you, if you haven't already, really start to look for opportunities. Number one, to take a break from the news and social media. Please don't leave your favorite news channel on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We all know that, that you can get uh, really overwhelmed with the news of the day and the news of the pandemic. So do take a break from social media. Take a break from your news channels. Make sure you're taking time in your daily activities to do something else. Do some activities you enjoy. Uh, take a walk, uh, play a game with your significant others and your children, just walk away from the day-to-day -day activities. Make sure you're eating healthy, you're getting plenty of sleep, you're exercising to the best of your ability. Keep breathing, uh, stretching, meditating. There, there are a number of things, and I'm sure Ruth can touch on some more as well as the rest of the team, and other things you can do. And then probably most importantly, as we've already touched on, connect with others, share your feelings, and if you're still struggling, ask for professional help. I just want to say the importance of routines, setting a schedule, you know, getting away from the computer, uh, setting goals that you can achieve to feel that sense of accomplishment. You know, my goal is to read a book a week, is not to spend 14 hours on the computer talking to people on Zoom or playing video games for my children. Um, if you're fortunate enough to isolate at home with other family members, have game nights. You know, we play actual board games or um, do crossword puzzles together. Um, follow that same routine. Get up in the morning, make your bed, take a shower, put on real clothes. Don't live in pajamas with an unmade bed all day. Um, finding those kind of routines and boundaries that you can live by that make you feel normal are essential in moving forward and getting back on track as things start to um, lighten up. In our synagogue in Scottsdale, uh, I arranged some Zoom sessions with religious school parents uh, so that they could share their concerns about parenting during the pandemic, 
And one of the suggestions I made to them was that they really need to carve out time, as was just mentioned. But when you're stuck at home, every day seems the same as the day before. So it's important to create regular family activities to define time. Every day should be different. Sunday could be movie night, Monday game night, Tuesday music night, Wednesday family cleaning night on a regular schedule. And I reminded the parents that Judaism has a calendar of events that mark off time. Friday night candle lighting, Kiddush and dinner, Shabbat morning services, Havdalah on Saturday night. And many of the parents told me that they are already taking advantage of these opportunities to make time special. And, and I hope they will continue to do so AC after COVID. And if I could add into that, there are a number of synagogues throughout the United States that recognize that the virtual platform we're in today needs to continue to exist. As we briefly touched on before, not everyone is going to be ready to come back to in-person services, whether Shabbat or any other event. And so I think where possible, we need to be thinking about in the world we're in today, as we've been discussing, how do we bring in individuals that aren't yet ready for face-to-face -face interaction, but still want to embrace their Judaism and be part of their local community and local congregation? Yes. I'll hit on a few things that haven't already been said. Most has been, a lot has been. Laughter, I just really want to remind you, laughter is such a good de-stressor. And um, whatever it is that brings laughter to you, whether it's a TV show, whether it's a comedy hour, whether it's something coming through the internet, take advantage of it. Um, state of mind is so important. So if you find yourself going down the rabbit hole, it's helpful to focus on gratitude. They found that if you focus on gratitude and even better write about it, it actually decreases negative thoughts. There have been studies on that. Um, also focus on something or someone you love, helping others. Um, one of the... Uh, just lost it, what I was gonna say. Um, I wanna again remind you to bring yourself back to the here and now if you're going into anticipatory fear, anxiety, which is what a lot of us are going through at this point. Um, develop some new activities. If you have never played a piano or wanna go back to an instrument, do that. Maybe learn a foreign language, not me, but you. <laughs> Um, try photography, painting. There's so many things to do that are new. Find out what brings you pleasure, like bubble baths, for instance, even. Um, and I wanna again remind you to uh, focus on what brings you pleasure and move towards what's, what brings you good feelings and Stay away from toxic situations, toxic people, toxic news, if it's getting too much for you. Um, with, with my clients, I'll just mention that for a second. I have focused with them individually on what it is that they need. For instance, I have one client who's a real extrovert and this is how she makes herself feel good. So what she did, at the beginning of the pandemic was set up where she would talk to one person every single night of the week. And it was the same person for the full year. And then she talked to other people in between, but she could always count on that person. Someone else that's a widow of three years actually met someone who will probably become her significant other 
through elite singles. The, whatever works for different people, you have to focus. And for me, I did too. Focus on what it is that we each need. Thank you. Uh, does the panel have any suggestions about uh, how to get our children and grandchildren back into the school routine once the summer is over and uh, we hope they return to in-person learning? Press well, chat. Yeah, I think I'll probably just take that one first, right? <laughs> um, so there's a lots of different um, children out there. I, I'll tell you when our schools announced they're starting to open, the minute it was announced, my sixth grader said, great, got her backpack packed and was ready to go. There's other kids out there who are like, well, I know my parents are still scared, so I'm scared too. So the first thing is, when you hear your school is opening, you're getting ready to send your child back to school, is you make it positive. I'm so excited you're going back to school. I can't wait. This is wonderful. I'm so comfortable. School's a safe place. School's great. The parents need to make sure you hide your own anxieties about it and not transfer that to your child. That's one of the first things that will help. Secondly, look for those fun things to make it special. Pick out those, the first week of outfits. Make a cool mask with school spirit or something they really like. Um, talk about, I'm looking forward to what you're gonna learn today. If your teacher reads you a story, remember the key idea and tell me all about it when you come home. Look for those conversation starters so the kids go to school looking for something to bring home. Um, review the guidelines and expectations the school sends out. The school should be sending, here's our routines, here's what to expect, here's what our rules are right now under the COVID guidelines for health. You know, go through that with your child, say, oh, see, not a big deal. You're going to wear a mask, you're going to go to lunch, you're going to have recess this way. Um, and if the school isn't providing those information, reach out and ask. I'm trying to help my child feel good about school. Can you tell me what recess and lunch will look like? Can you tell me what the day looks like? Another important part of going back to school is the anxiety about friends. There are some kids who haven't talked to some of their friends in over a year now. What to expect with that? Say, hi, I missed you. Um, it's okay to have missed people. Um, also have to accept people. I, and my own daughter went back to school and said, well, I'm not gonna talk to these three kids because they didn't wear masks and they were traveling this whole time while we were home isolating. And like, well, no, you need to forgive. Everyone had their own way of living their life during the pandemic and we need to forgive and accept and move on, it's, it's, it's a new day. Um, it's, it's just really important that the kids feel supported and that we recognize it's a really good thing and a good step for our community and their education. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me mention that in my own congregation, a few people told me that um, they have a lot of anger toward other parents in the community because those other parents were sending their children out to play while they kept their children at home for the sake of safety. And that's an interesting issue. And it's something that uh, some parents are trying to deal with. Well, let, let, me, let me go on. Um, uh, Iris Lasky uh, sent in a question. Uh, this is for Chad. Uh, how do you view the learning that your children have been able to receive this past year? And she says that her grandson graduated from your school last year. So um, our teachers, so for my school in particular, our teachers worked really hard to make things as normal as possible. A lot of our regular routines and teaching continued. Um, I think there's a lot of variations in what kids took away from it. Uh, some kids actually have done wonderful online. It's actually been a better experience for them than being in person for some kids. Their personalities match the online learning. For other kids, it's been a challenge and a struggle. Uh, there's, there's varying levels of support at home of abilities. Uh, and it's really, it's really hard. You can't, it's, there's not one answer for this question. It really is every child has been unique and different in their experience. Um, I can say for, for my staff and in my district, we've really tried the best we can to follow all the Department of Public Health guidelines and provide a good education for kids. Um, some teachers held classes all day long, extra classes, calling kids to small groups, ran those small interventions. We had our support staff who met with kids outside of the instructional day to practice reading and math skills. So um, whereas I don't have any gauge to say, hey, they learned great and it's just like a normal year or not. I don't have that, that kind of information or data yet, but we are getting ready for our end of year state testing here. And so we will have data to actually look back and reflect on to say, 
what did we succeed at and what holes still exist and what's our work next year to help the kids do better? Yes. And uh, here's another question relating to uh, children. Um, how can parents get their children away from all the screens that they've spent time on during the pandemic, both from school and, and from recreation? That's been the hardest part of the pandemic is screen time because now the kids are required to be on school all day long on a screen, whether it's an, a screen activity or a live meeting. And then they wanna have their free time with their friends and their social lives are on screens as well, the, the video games and the online chats. Um, in my household, I, I tried as hard as I could to have family game nights away from the TV, away from the screen. We, we, we go on walks. Uh, we have regular walks with some of our bubble friends as well. And we try to do things out and about um, safely. So I think whenever you can put in, into play a routine and schedule that has a, we go for our walk for an hour, we're gonna walk this, we're gonna go to the park and, and play basketball if there's no one else there or those kind of routines, take bikes out for a ride or a scooter, always a good idea. Um, the weather's getting nicer in the, during the summer part of the pandemic, my kids are outside swimming. Um, those kind of things are really important. And then reading time, let's read together. Let's read a story together. Let's write some, let's draw a picture. Um, we ordered our kids paint by number projects. They were at, they're doing painting just to get them off their screens as well. So anything you can think of your child might like that's not screen related is definitely a good thing. And, and I think the other thing, and, and, and Chad is absolutely spot on, is as parents, we still have to set limits and, and you have to set expectations. And, and the reality is, as we talked about, parents need to kind of calendar and choreograph the day's events. And that needs to include time away from screen. And sometimes a parent's going to actually have to be a parent and say, we're turning this off now. But, but reality is parents do have a very active role. I also wanted to go back to something with students and learning. If as a parent, your child is really having difficulty in the transition back to in-person learning or is still struggling in virtual learning, talk to your principal, talk to your teacher. Uh, our school districts, our teachers, our special education teachers are very knowledgeable. They understand all this and they're going to work with individual parents and the children, but they need sometimes to know that the child is struggling. So as a parent, if your child is not optimally learning, at least speak up and say something to your school professional. And in addition, a lot of school districts and ours in particular are offering summer programs to help um, reinforce and review things that were expected to be learned over the course of the past school year. So that's also an important thing to take advantage of this summer. Thank you. I'd like to move on and um, talk about the millennials. Technically, that means those born between 1980 and 1994, people in their 30s and 40s. Before COVID, the millennials often heard from my generation, their parents and grandparents, that they had it too easy. But during DC, during COVID, that has changed. The millennials are now the generation who lived through World War III. They have come of age in a world brought to its knees by a tiny unseen enemy. And they now know that everything they have can be taken away in an instant. So let me ask the panel, what are your thoughts? What is your advice to the millennials? So let me speak up on behalf of my generation and our avocado toasts. Um, I'm 36 years old, so I am right smack dab in, uh, in the middle of the millennial generation. And with respect, I don't think that uh, the troubles of this generation started with COVID. This generation has now lived through two, perhaps three major economic events that will make it so that the millennial generation will be the first modern American generation to almost assuredly do worse economically than their parents and grandparents. The American promise that you can do better 
will not be available by and large to the people in this demographic by virtue of the uh, successive crashes of 2001, 2008, and now the COVID experience. Um, the Washington Post had a piece that uh, did the analysis on inflation adjusted GDP growth in the first 15 years of each generation's time in the workforce. So those critical first decade and a half for establishing oneself economically. For the so-called greatest generation, uh, the generation that, that fought in World War II, they experienced between 50 and 60% GDP growth in their first two decades in the workforce. Boomers experienced 40% growth. Gen Xers experienced 30% growth. And millennials are experiencing something on the order of perhaps 15% growth. It's a staggering difference. In the first two months of the pandemic, 52% of people under the age of 45 either lost their job, were placed on leave, or had their hours reduced. A majority of those under 45 had a change to their working lives. Only 26% of people over 45 had a similar change. Um, a piece in the Atlantic said, Millennials are now, I'm quoting, millennials are now facing the second once in a lifetime downturn in their short careers. The first one put them on a worse lifetime earnings trajectory and blocked them out of the assets market. The second is sapping their paychecks just as they enter into peak earning years with 20 million kids relying on them too. There's no good news in the recession and no good news in the pandemic, the author wrote. But for millennials, it feels like there's never any good news at all. So I guess the, the thing that I want to communicate here um, is that uh, this current reality is striking a younger generation economically very differently than it's striking an older generation. And that has to do with structures put in place decades ago that led to rapid rise in higher education costs and a crippling amount of student debt that transformed the housing market to make it very, very difficult for young people to enter into the market and begin to build wealth. I think we are gonna to need to have a society-wide conversation about how to create economic structures that if they can't necessarily rescue this potentially lost generation economically, um, will at least ensure that we don't repeat the same pattern for Gen Zers and those who come beyond. Um, this, is, uh, this is not to say that there aren't significant advantages that young people experience, um, but in terms of the way that we have structured our economy in this country, these crises, the twin crises of 2008 and the crisis of COVID are a double hit that are, are really devastating. I wonder too, I wonder about today's high schoolers and college students, Gen Z. Are they going to focus on making money and living the American dream? Or will they learn from the pandemic how they can make the world a better place? What do you think? It's my hope that they learn to make the world a better place, that they learn from this experience that all the material things in the world are as important as health and, con and connections to people. So it's my hope that they'll use their experiences now and their creative use of technology to make the world better for everybody, develop something really wonderful. Yes. It's certainly my, my hope as well um, that we'll all learn from this experience how to prioritize those intangibles, those relationships, um, to develop that, that practice of gratitude that Dr. Fisher, you talked about is, as essential to mental health and certainly essential to, to our Jewish tradition. Um, but, but in terms of the framework of the question, you know, it's, it's been said a lot over the course of this past year, well, we're all in the same boat. 
And the truth is we are not all in the same boat. Some of us are in the Titanic. Well, that's a bad metaphor. Some of us are in a cruise ship. <laughs> Some of us are in a lifeboat. Um, for those of us who have the color skin that I have, I am in a different boat than people of different races in America. Men and women are in different boats in America. Gay and straight are in different boats in America. And so while we have all lived through a shared experience, we have lived through it differently. And the way that we will respond to each other is gonna to need to come from an assumption that just because you and I lived through COVID does not mean that I know your experience and you know mine. And I, th I think the other area we need to be aware of is that immediate gratification uh, is not where we need to be. And, and I think as Dr. Ruth had said, it's uh, practicing kindness, practicing gratitude. And as everyone else on the panel had said, we're hopeful that this will be part of that learning component of the youngest of our generations. But we, we really have to get away from that immediate gratification, immediate gratitude model that really has been pervasive throughout our society in particular from a reward recognition standpoint. Um, we'll get back to what Adam was talking about in just a moment. Um, but, but let me ask the panel to focus on the baby boomers for a moment, my generation. What are the special needs of the baby boomers right now? What advice would you give them? Dr. Ruth, perhaps you, you could chime in. Sure. Um, I just first want to say I am so glad, um, Rabbi Adam, that you spoke to what you did economically about the, the millennials. So I have a 31-year-old, and I have to say the experience has been one of constant recreating for them and constant being kicked economically. And it's, it, it is worse if you're not white and if you don't have parents of prosperity. But let me go back to your question, Rabbi David. Um, one of the problems with the baby boomers is that many of them are not tech savvy and they have had to rely on their children or grandchildren to get them onto Zoom. Uh, some of them have not done that. This is not a group that that applies to, obviously, because you're all here. But we have had to, I'm in a square dance club, and we've had to reach out to a few of the people to help them to get on to Zoom. Some of them don't even have computers. Uh, so I, to me, that's been a real problem that we have encouraged them to really get help with. From, somebody in their family. Um, another thing that's so important is that many have been isolated. And again, encouraging them to join groups. Groups, what they have found is that people that live longer, live longer because uh, they are members of a lot of groups as well as taking good care of themselves through things that have been mentioned already, sleep, exercise, and exercise, uh, some of the baby boomers are great with exercise, others are not. And it's crucial because at that age, you're really gonna lose your mobility and ability to get out there with other people. Um, one of the other things is some people are not used to initiating phone calls and it's important that they do that uh, and that we help them to learn how to do that if they're having difficulty with it. Um, as a whole, baby boomers are either not working, or if they are, they have not been hurt by this economically. That's one of the positives. Um, I'm sure I have a lot more to answer, but <laughs> I'll let other people go on. I, I think the other large area of concern is as our baby boomer, which by the way is now the second largest group next to the millennials, uh, is really health and, and overall deterioration in health 
increased need for utilization of healthcare. And obviously with the pandemic, a number of our baby boomers have either totally ignored or at least postponed access back into healthcare. So I know what we're seeing now as this light at the end of the tunnel seems to be coming is some of the seniors coming back with very uncontrol uncontrolled medical conditions. And what we're seeing in the hospitalization side of this is people that are being admitted to the hospital, non-COVID related are much more ill than they otherwise would have been due to lack of attention of some of the chronic healthcare conditions or waiting till the last possible moment to enter the system. Thank you. Let's talk about um, the massive changes in Jewish life, DC during COVID. Although I think the changes are really part of a, lar a larger ongoing shift in how synagogues need to be reaching out to people. And that shift has been going on for about 20 years now. Uh, there are lots of things we could talk about. How do we communicate online? How do Jewish institutions communicate online? How can rabbis and cantors speak both to the camera and to the people in the sanctuary? Uh, what are the key messages that Jewish organizations like Women's League uh, should be giving right now? Um, one message I'm trying to deliver to my own congregants is that they should be proud of all of the sacrifices that they have made during COVID. But they have to hold on a while longer. Uh, they need sovereignty. Uh, they need patience. So let me open that up to you. Talk about the changes in Jewish life during COVID. And I think you've you've covered a number of them. And I think one of the areas from a Jewish life perspective we're really going to need to think about, especially as in person, in the synagogue, with uh, our temple members becomes uh, more prevalent is, will there continue to be a robust opportunity to practice Judaism in a local congregation in a virtual world? And, and I think there's a lot of differing opinions, especially in our conservative aspects of uh, Jewish life and what we do in synagogue. And as high holidays, we're starting to prepare for those actually. And, and I think there is going to be an inflection point here that we as congregants, that we in the synagogue, that rabbis and canners are going to need to discuss. Can we maintain both a virtual presence and an in-person presence and create the world of Judaism that we all have found so precious, so enduring and, and needing to occur? I think there will be a lot of structural changes that will come out of this in terms of institutional partnerships and perhaps consolidations where access to Jewish communal life has in some way never been easier because it's no longer bounded by geography um, and where access to the most robust Jewish life feels like it's never been harder because it's become transactional through the medium of, of virtual gathering rather than through the sort of thicker, richer in-person experience. There, there is gonna be a remarkably important, uh, uh, not just a once in a generation, but perhaps once in a century um, kind of renegotiation of what Jewish community looks like over the coming years. And I, for one, am very excited about it. I am anxious. Um, because big change is always anxiety producing, but I'm very excited for what can be. I wanted to just add one other thing, and I'm, I'm sure this conversation will continue, but um, I want to encourage all of the remarkable women here who have carried so much of the weight of our communal life over this past year to feel really proud of you, of your work and of your institutions. 
Jewish communal institutions are not known for being nimble and quick to change. We are an old people who move slowly. And yet somehow in the span of weeks, even of days, our institutions which have been doing it the way they had done it for generations, managed to completely reimagine their offerings and to reach people who had never before been reached. That's a remarkable achievement. And that's an achievement that's happened because of a partnership between lay leaders and clergy and professional staff that I think we can all be justifiably really proud of. One other piece on top of that, if you haven't written a note of appreciation to your synagogue's rabbi, to your synagogue's executive director, because rabbis, we actually get lots of appreciation. We talk about how nobody appreciates us, but we get lots of appreciation. You know who gets no appreciation? The executive directors of synagogues, the, the professional staff who are keeping those institutions going. They hear about the complaints. Send your synagogue's ED a love letter and say, I can't believe that you managed to figure out how to get us through this year and to get us through this year having made an impact. Um, and then figure out with them how to give the staff of your Jewish institutions a significant vacation. Not a couple of days off, but a couple of weeks off. This has been a really difficult year and those people who are holding the institutions are burnt out profoundly. And so that's gonna take the will of lay leaders to insist that clergy go away to Hawaii with their families once that's possible and safe, that synagogue EDs don't answer their phone in the middle of the night because there's something going wrong with the plumbing, that um, we actually have a period of time to recover and regroup. So, so my, my message to you on this is, is to please, if you haven't already, to express gratitude and to figure out ways to support the restoration of the professionals who have made it possible for us to do this incredible work of pivoting and providing ongoing services through the pandemic. And to feel proud if you are part of the lay leadership that has made that possible. You have done something remarkable and, and not unprecedented in Jewish history, but rare in Jewish history to address a circumstance and take a giant leap forward into the unknown. Adam, there's a question in the chat that's directed to you. Um, have any of the people studying to become Jewish been converted? In other words, can you take them to the mikvah? Yeah, so um, the program that I run sees several hundred people a year, um, many of them on a conversion path. The way that conversion in our movement um, continues to operate is that somebody needs two things in order to become a Jew. They need to have done a period of substantive learning and they need the support of a local rabbi and participation and um, embedding in a local community. What that's looked like is harder these days. Um, though I'll tell you that for some newcomers to Judaism, the pandemic has been an unexpected boon. It is safer and easier to come zoom in to a service. If you are a newcomer who doesn't read Hebrew and doesn't know when to stand up, sit down or bow, then it is to walk into our physical spaces. And I am hearing from many new Jews that they have had the courage to now participate in Jewish institutions virtually. And that they think that that experience will make it easier and more comfortable for them to participate in person. Um, Certainly there has been a slowdown in conversions being completed just as there's been a slowdown in baby namings and weddings. I am doing my first wedding this afternoon in a year, um, outdoors and distanced with 100% vaccinated folks. Um, there's been a slowdown in all of those big milestone moments, um, but the preparation toward those milestones has continued and there have been many, many people who have found their way into converting into Jewish life 
this year, um, despite the pandemic, and perhaps even some who might not have been able to do it were it not for the pandemic. We have a, a short period of time remaining. Uh, I want to pick up on something that uh, Ruth and Adam both touched upon. Uh, DC, during COVID, America has been going through a period of political polarization, racial tension, and heightened awareness to gender issues. And of course, all of these relate to the grief and anxiety that people feel. Uh, there's a saying, um, in order to live, we have to die, D-I-E, stands for diversity, inclusion, and equity. Diversity, inclusion, and equity. America needs to die. How might a clearer focus on diversity, inclusion, and equity inform Jewish life? I mean, I can go ahead and start. I mean, yeah, we actually know it as equity, inclusion, diversity, EID, uh, rather than die. But, but reality is, that from a standpoint of being Jewish, better than any other religion, we really do understand how you bring everyone together. And, and I think there's a large opportunity here within this very large, almost pandemic additional platform of not only being sensitive to each other and respectful of each other, but welcoming of everyone who believes in Judaism, who wants to be part of Judaism. And I think the most important thing we can do is live our lives every day understanding that every human being, irregardless of where they come from, who they represent, how they identify themselves, needs to be welcome into the Jewish religion if they wanna join us and, and be sensitive to the needs of everyone out there in our communities, irregardless of how they represent themselves or what their feelings are. And I think as something Ruth said, deep listening, understanding, Practicing, practicing that gratefulness and kindness will go a long way in helping heal a lot of what's going on in America and throughout the world. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, this is, none of this is new. It's just that in isolate, well, between certain things that have been going on in the last few years and isolating, things have come more to a fore than they had before. And as I said earlier, when they come to a fore, then we have a chance to heal. Until we are willing to really look at it, we won't take the steps to change. We won't take the steps to heal. I believe we now have the best chance we've had in many, many, many years to move forward. And I'd like to address something that's, that I think is in the mind of some people. When Black Lives Matter comes up, some people respond, all lives matter. And I want to address this because all lives do matter. But if you think about it, if you are living on a cul-de-sac and there's seven houses, and one of those houses is burning, which house matters? That's what they mean by Black Lives Matter. It doesn't mean that they matter over others. It means that that's a house that's burning. And although this isn't exactly what you asked, I think it's pertinent. And I think that we, the more we can do to understand what's underneath what people are feeling, the more we can really listen, the more we can openly ask questions that we're willing to listen to the answers to, the more chance we have of healing. And I do feel that since we've been so persecuted as a people, we know what that's like. 
we need to really extend it to everybody. I think a has, lot of making changes. Has reentry into society contributed to the, um, the anger and the societal violence? What do you think? I'm sorry, did you address that to me or? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 now that people are re-entering into society, does that actually contribute to the anger and the societal violence? I think people are expressing it more and that we're already, it's like we're burning. As a nation, we are burning. And it's being expressed more as we come in and I think our children will express it probably in some ways that will ignite the adults. Um, because they have, in all sorts of ways that have been mentioned earlier about whether to wear a mask, whether you believe COVID was even real. These are questions where a lot of people have really disagreed. And it's gonna take a lot, a lot for us to be able to really truly listen. And the only way we can make changes in our society is in listening and meeting somebody where they are, which is different from where many of us are. Chad, did you wanna hop in? I'm good, thank you. Okay. Well, let me read a couple more questions that have popped up on the chat. Um, going forward, when we are back in the community, how do we let people know how close we want to get physically without hurting anyone's feelings? Uh, is shaking hands ever coming back? Touching the Torah as it goes around the room? Any reaction to that? Well, I know right now when people come to our office, we greet them at the front door. We don't have people in the building at this moment in time, but it's always, you keep your hands at your side. You, you say, oh, nice to meet you. And you kind of nod your head. You, you show with your face how happy you are, but you know, it, it kind of gives the message of, well, I'm not shaking your hand today, um, but I am happy to see you and, and I'm greeting you. Yes. And another thing that we could do is something like this to show that we're embracing them, but without embracing without touching. Yeah. Here's a question. Uh, how does a young man find a date without the guidance of direction and how to be connected? I guess the whole issue of, of, of dating, uh, dating during COVID, of course, it has been much discussed. Dr. Ruth, do you want to take this? I just saw that you were unmuted. Go ahead, Rabbi Greenwald. Oh, I, <laughs> I don't know how people date. Um, I was never any good at it. Um, <laughs> um, you know, as as people are starting to reemerge, um, there you, you want to talk about you're not sure when you're allowed to shake hands. There's a lot of questions about getting close that uh, people are having to um, negotiate uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, you know, I, I do think this is an area where um, already before the pandemic, so much has shifted to new tools. Um, and, uh, and, and the virtual space um, that, uh, that now so much of dating is conducted via apps. And um, I, I think it's just one more example of the ways in which we are not going back to a 100% in-person world. We are going to a hybridized world. We're going to a world where some things will take place in the virtual space and some things will take place in the in-person space and 100% of each is not desirable. Yeah. Um, I actually think in some ways this has been good because 
young men and young women need to talk to each other before they get to see each other in person. And it can become a deeper conversation than it would have otherwise, uh, just virtually because they can't see each other right away, or hopefully they're not. Um, and then when they reach each other, uh, they've talked enough and really gotten to feel that they wanna get to know each other, they can choose to really isolate for two weeks beforehand and then meet and to meet outdoors. Or really now a lot of people, most people are getting vaccinated so it will be more possible to meet in person. Um, but there are some good things with this because you can go deeper before getting involved in any other way. Yes. The phone. Thank you. Our, think, our time is running out, and um, I want to end this discussion on a high note. So let me ask the panelists, what are some positive things that people have gained from this period? So, so I can go ahead and go first. I, I, I think for some of the positive things around this is, number one, we are getting through this. And even though there's been incredible loss of life, incredible stressors, uh, change in lifestyle, we are getting through this. And, and, and people need to take a moment to recognize that despite all of the negativity, all of the challenges, and all of the issues that, that have occurred within this pandemic, the peripheral pandemics that are occurring around it, we, we are going to get through it. Each individual is stronger, and they've created a model of being able to get through that. Hopefully along that journey, people have figured out how to eat as healthy as they can, have been able to create some relaxation and rest around it, have gotten more creative in their own personal exercise space, are improving their skill set around uh, talking and listening, and are able to practice gratitude and kindness. So for me, those are the opportunities that have been ongoing for a number of us. If you haven't developed that breadth of skill set, there's still an opportunity to do that. And to recognize that change will continue to be constant. And while we see that light at the end of the tunnel, uh, we just need to be a little more patient. Thank you. Uh, we've actually been in a liminal period which in many ways has been uncomfortable, but it's also been wonderful. And when I refer to a liminal period, I'm talking about the period when a caterpillar goes into the chrysalis. They're caught in the chrysalis. They're not where they were and they're not where they're going to be. And in order to come out of that, they really need to struggle. And that is in part what we have been doing. We've been struggling to recreate ourselves. And to me, that's a real positive. And hopefully we will as individuals and as a nation come out as that beautiful butterfly. Um, in addition, I think we've done a lot of reprioritizing during this time. And I think that's important because a lot of us have become closer to what's really important to us, have let go of a lot of things that we're not. Um, and if we can remember to do this and to carry this forward into wherever we are going, I think that will be wonderful. Of course, Zoom has been a great boon in so many ways. Um, I think yeah, we've slowed down, we've reprioritized. And I would use the words mindfulness and resilience, just like the Jewish people. I, I, I think if I was gonna summarize it in a word or two, those are my two words. I think it's also sparked creativity, looking at ways we normally do things and how to expand it and modernize it and change it. And I also um, think we've all developed new skills and how to keep in contact with people who may be far away. 
So I want to just mod I want to modify one thing that I said before. I said that this has been unusual in our history to be faced with circumstances that have transformed our world and to have taken a leap forward. The, the truth is, is this actually couldn't be more Jewish. We are the people over and over and over again who have experienced transformation, some of it beautiful, much of it catastrophic, and have figured out how to put the pieces back together into something more beautiful. The, the, the rabbi I am looking up to most these days is an incredible rabbi of Chicago, Rabbi B'nai Lappi, graduate of JATS. Rabbi Lappi gave a TED talk a few years ago in which she said, there are three possible responses to when your world falls apart. One response is denial. We've all practiced that from time to time and we all know people who somehow have managed to get through this whole year pretending that the world isn't on fire. One possibility is becoming bitter. And I suspect we have all had our bitter moments. And the third possibility is evolution. That when the world falls apart, whether our individual world or our collective world, and we can't do things the way that we did it before, we do have the invitation to evolve. And that's, that's been the Jewish story over and over and over again. And there will be people who will have faced this year um, and have lived in denial. And there will be people who will come out of this year embittered of spirit. Um, but I, I do think that we have this incredible opportunity to evolve together and to make these last months and year our teacher for how we can live differently with one another, how we can prioritize differently, as people have said, how we can make a future that is more equitable, more just, and more fulfilling. That's actually how we've always approached moments like this. And I have great confidence we'll do it again. If there's anything that Jews have learned through the centuries, it is that hope is a choice. Hope is a choice. And uh, we, we can choose to be optimistic. I want to thank all of our panelists, and I want to thank our, our audience for their questions. And uh, our thanks to Women's League for this wonderful conference. I would like to thank the panel, Rabbi Klatsker, Rabbi Greenwald, Dr. Fisher, Dr. Hoffman, and Chad Rose for a truly wonderful discussion and for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be with us today. Thank you. Just a little reminder, please change your name from iPhone or anything that is not your first and last names. Thank you. I would like to introduce Maxine Silverberg, Sisterhood Support Vice President at this time. Thank you. I am the Regent Sisterhood Support Vice President. My name is Maxine Silverberg. And I want to thank our Sisterhood Presidents and their Sisterhoods in our region, in our PSW region. I'm going to read the names and the name, just the name of the, of the Sisterhood, the Synagogue Sisterhood. I will start with Melinda Marcus, President of Dot Ariel Valley Village, California. Penny Gordon, Miriam Hearn, Karen Yagobian, a co-president at Adot Shalom, Los Angeles, California. Eileen Bloom, President, Beth L Congregation of Phoenix, Arizona. Karen Boyer, President, Congregation Beth L La Jolla, California. Lori Hoffman, Sisterhood President. Congregation Beth Shalom, Santa Clarita, California. Christine Buchholzer, uh, Nora Yonak, Sisterhood Co-Presidents. Congregation B'nai Israel, Sisterhood, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Sarah Williams, Sisterhood President, Congregation B'nai uh, Zion, Sisterhood, El Paso, Texas. Linda Alexander, Congregation near Tamid of South Base, uh, Rancho Palos Verdes, California. Miriam Skeeter Marcus, Congregation Ortsion Sisterhood, Scottsdale, Arizona. Gwendolyn Wexler, Wendy Weber, Co President, Congregation Tikvat Jacob Beth Torah, Manhattan Beach. 
Nancy Carlton, Sister of the President, Pasadena Jewish Temple and Center, Pasadena, California. Sue Moss, Sister of the President, Sh uh, Shomrei Torah Synagogue, West Hills, California. Mary, uh, I'm sorry, Marcy Melton and Lena Bernazarian, co-presidents, Sinai Temple Sisterhood, Los Angeles, California. Lisa Leonard, Sisterhood President, Temple Aliyah, Woodland Hills, California. Paula Rubin, Sisterhood President, Temple Ami Shalom, West Covina, California. Ann Spar, Sisterhood President, Temple Bethan, Los Angeles, California. Barbara Erler, Temp Temple Bethamet, Anaheim, California. Anna Marie Luna, President, Temple Beth Shalom, Sisterhood, Long Beach, California. Michelle Hess, Sisterhood President, Temple Beth Shalom, uh, Sisterhood of Whit Sister Sisterhood, Whittier, California. Whitney Sado, Sisterhood President, Temple Beth Shalom, Las Vegas, California. Marilyn Sadomsky, President, Temple Beth Shalom of the East Valley, Sisterhood Ch Chandler, Arizona. Cindy Scherer, President, Temple Eitz Chaim, Sisterhood, Thousand Oaks, California. Shoshana Bearer and Melanie Garver, Sisterhood Presidents, Co-Presidents, Temple Isaiah, Palm Springs, California. Diane Schwartz, Carol Maller, Sisterhood Co-Presidents, Temple Ramazion, Northridge, California. Sharon Bornstein, Sisterhood President, Temple Shalom of Ontario, Ontario, California. Olga Worm, Sisterhood President, Tafereth Israel, Sisterhood San Diego, California. Mona Trachtenberg, Sisterhood President, Valley Beth Israel, Sun Valley, California. Ann Mazur, Rachel Greenberg, Co-Presidents, Sisterhood, Congregation, B'nai Israel Tustin, California. Deborah Goldberger, Sisterhood President, Valley Beth Shalom, Sisterhood Encino, California. Irene Purcell, Sisterhood President, Congregation B'nai Jacob, Bakersfield. Hopefully I didn't make any mistakes and I apologize if I did. I was trying to be fast. <laughs> it's yours. Back Thank you so much, Maxine. Um, congratulations to all the presidents of all our sisterhoods. Um, take great pride in you. Um, we are going to be having a 30 minute lunch break at this time. And when we come back, well, before we go, we're going to do one other presentation. But after our lunch break, when we come back, we will be going right into our workshops. So please be prepared for that. At this time, I'd like to introduce Susan Ben Rubin. Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to present the calendar diary to Carol Madvig, the new president of the Pacific Southwest region. May our flame continue to light up the conservative movement and may it light your way, which is the message from Debbie Painter Goldich in the calendar diary. And congratulations on becoming the new president and may you have a very successful term. Thank you so much, Susan. Okay, so now we are going to take our 30 minute lunch break and on screen will be the tribute ads um, playing through lunch with some music. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back at 1235.